like to jump on to right away uh, that you heard. Dr. Craig? Well, I was very heartened, uh, Jordan, by your affirmation of the objectivity of moral values and duties. You said there are things that are unquestionably good and unquestionably evil, that these moral values are not things that are invented, but they are discovered. And I couldn't agree more. And I would want to push you on this to say that this very consideration ought to help you to move through naturalism and beyond naturalism to a transcendent ground for the objectivity of these moral values and duties. Because they won't be found in naturalism. Uh, the naturalist is trapped in the lower story. Uh, objective moral values and duties are not physical entities described by the laws of nature. These are transcendent realities, either platonic uh, or else grounded in God. Um, and therefore, the very affirmation of the objectivity of moral values and duties that was so strong throughout your talk, uh, which I so appreciate, it's, it's anti-relativistic, it's objectivistic. I want to I want to encourage you to push through that naturalism to finding a transcendent ground for these in theism. I think that's the most plausible moral theory that will enable us to affirm the objectivity of these moral values and duties. Yep. <clears throat> I've tried to work out the sorts of ideas that I portrayed in this talk today within a naturalistic framework as much as possible. Well, for, because it, the naturalistic technique is so powerful, not, not least for that, but also because there's glimmerings in the scientific literature of the sorts of ideas that you portrayed when you mentioned that the evolutionary biologists are increasingly making the claim that morality is a biological adaptation and I think you can make a very strong case for that a much stronger case than has actually been made so far um, I think there is a, a a very sophisticated ethic that has evolved that we recognize as a consequence of the evolution of our cognitive and emotional structures I think that that recognition manifests itself in admiration you know people are very imitative it's one of the things that characterizes us in contradistinction to animals who are not very imitative. It's probably the precondition for our linguistic capacity. One of the things that characterizes human existence is the capacity to spontaneously pick a model for emulation, right? A model for admiration. And that's the manifestation of that moral instinct to say, well, to admire is to want to copy. You say, well, what do you want to copy? Well, you want to copy that which is most admirable. What is most admirable? Well, what is most admirable, that starts to become a, that starts to become a transcendent question. Right? You, you can imagine that the, the, the local examples of what's admirable, they're right in front of you and, and, and they're concrete and tangible. But to abstract out from that, that which is admirable in and of itself is simultaneously to construct something like the representation of a transcendent good. And that's, to some degree, how religious conceptions emerge from their underlying biological substrate. Now, you might say, well, that's merely reducing the religious conceptualization, the religious abstraction of what's good to the biological substrate. And I think you can read it that way, but I don't think that that necessarily indicates what it is. I think that the entire process of evolution is somehow shaping itself around maybe platonic ideas, something like that, some transcendent good. And that it's a mistake to assume that just because you can make an association between the transcendent abstract good and the process of evolution, that one is necessarily reducible to another. It, it fact, isn't the way reality that be works. To commit the genetic fallacy to try to say that because one's moral beliefs originated through such uh, a biological evolutionary process that therefore they are explained away and have no objective validity. That, that just is to commit well, a I, genetic yeah, fallacy. Well, I think partly it? what happens too is that you, you 
at that level of analysis, you have to start questioning your initial presumptions, like the idea that the most true truth is objective, because I'm not sure it is. I don't think we understand what constitutes truth very well. And there's the truth that you act out, as well as the truth that tells you what the world is made of, and those aren't necessarily the same thing. And so things get very murky at that level of abstraction. But one thing I have learned from attempting to reduce religious preconceptions to their biological substrate is that there's always something left over that you haven't explained. And it's, it's not something trivial because every time I look into what's left over, it turns out to be unutterably deep and I get rid of some more of it and the rest becomes unutterably deep. And so, Dr. Goldstein. Yeah. Um, I believe just as strongly in uh, objective moral truths. And I do, in fact, um, I, I, I completely reject your argument uh, that it requires either a grounding in God um, or into, in some sort of platonic uh, ideals. Um, there, there is an ancient argument, it goes back to Plato, from Plato's Euthyphro, uh, that of, uh, uh, tries to argue that, well, quite in my book, successfully argues that the addition of God really doesn't help with grounding morality. Um, and this is the, uh, Socrates asked uh, a priest, Euthyphro, of the ancient Athenian, religion, um, uh, tell me, what is it that makes something good? And, and Euthyphro answered uh, that, God, that God loves it. Uh, God, it's God's attitude, or the God's attitude, uh, that, that makes it good. And Socrates asks, um, well, does God love the good because it's good, or is his loving it what makes it good? Um, if it's the first, that God loves giving to the vulnerable, to the victims, to the orphan, to the widow, uh, because it's good, then there is something independent in virtue of which God loves these actions that makes them good, and that constitutes the reason uh, for the goodness. And if God hates genocide and loves uh, charity, uh, then there is a reason in virtue of which uh, God has these moral attitudes. And if God himself has no reason for it, if it's just whim, if it's caprice, then is that really satisfying our answer as to what makes good acts good and bad acts bad? That the addition of God doesn't ground things at all. It, leaves, it, it, it makes what seems to us mysterious and answers it with another mystery. Um, so th this is, you know, an ancient argument repeated by Spinoza, repeated by, by, by Russell, repeated by people. Um, and, and I would like to ask you how you answer the question. And I, uh, the whole history of moral philosophy uh, from Spinoza, you know, through Kant, through Rawls, through Tom Nagel, all these arguments have given completely naturalist uh, arguments to try to ground uh, morality, and they are, in fact, the kinds of arguments by means of which we've made progress, uh, in fact, uh, that all of the individual rights movements, uh, the, you know, anti-slavery and uh, emancipation of women and uh, on and on and on, um, have been made on the basis of completely naturalist uh, arguments. Uh, taking it uh, as, as elemental from something that we learn from our own lives uh, that we matter 
and that uh, if we want to answer what is it in virtue of which we matter, what we get to fairly quickly is it's in virtue of something that we share with everybody else. And this is the kind of arguments that have actually had real consequences in terms of uh, emancipating and making real people's lives better uh, ever since, I would say, the Enlightenment, actually. And so, so I guess my question to you is double. What do you say to the Euthyphro argument? How does God really help? And two, what do you say about the whole progress of moral philosophy, which has in fact been completely secular and has helped more people than, I'm not gonna say than religion, I'm not gonna say it. Uh, uh, but religion, believe me, has made a lot of people suffer as well. When you speak about Auschwitz, it's very hard for me not to cry. Every person of my generation in my family is named after a dead child who died there. Uh, so to me, this is extremely personal. My very name, Rebecca, uh, is some child who died. Uh, so that this is... Uh, how does this come up? I don't know. I just had to say it. Uh, I'm sorry. Those right. are my two questions to you. Good. I'm really surprised. I'm really surprised to hear you trot out the old Euthyphro dilemma, because this has been answered over and over again by contemporary Christian philosophers like Robert Adams, William Alston, and others. The Euthyphro dilemma is a false dilemma. It posits two non-mutually exhaustive choices. Either the gods love something because it is good, or uh, uh, it is good and therefore they love it. The theistic alternative to the Euthyphro dilemma is that something um, is good because it is identical with God. God is the good. God is what Plato referred to as the good. Um, so that the, the reason God wills something is because he is good. And his moral commands to us reflect the goodness of his own intrinsic moral nature. God is by nature essentially kind, loving, compassionate, fair, and so forth. And this completely resolves the Euthyphro mm -hmm. dilemma because it's a third alternative uh, to the, uh, the question. Now, in terms of the second question you raise, the problem with all of these theories is that they can't justify their starting point. They just take it for granted that some sort of humanism is true, that there is something about human beings that is intrinsically morally valuable, but that's precisely, you see, what's called into question by naturalism. Um, if the film of evolutionary history were rewound, and shot over again, a very different sort of creature might have evolved from the evolutionary process with a very different set of values. And by what right would we be able to say, well, our values are the correct ones and yours are the wrong ones? It's all socially, culturally relative. And so while I applaud the advances in human rights um, and things of the sort that you mentioned, I, I want to help by offering a foundation for the objectivity of the moral values and duties that we both hold dear, a foundation that I think is conspicuously lacking in naturalism. I, I think the way you approach this, it's wrong, um, that, um, you know, there is a kind of transcendental argument, meaning, you know, that kind of argument that is inspired by Kant, by Immanuel Kant, where we look at not an extra fact in order to justify something, but we look at the very conditions that make certain kinds of thinking um, possible. Uh, the, the, the categories of the mind, he, and this is how he tried to confront Hume's problem, we can't, we can't justify induction. Hume, David Hume 
had uh, dem demonstrated this. There's no non-circular way to uh, justify induction. And yet, rational life depends on induction. We can't justify deduction, logic, uh, non-circularly. How could one accept any argument for deduction if, if that was the very thing that is being called into question? There is a kind of normative reasoning without which life is impossible. And we certainly apply it always to ourselves. Um, we, if somebody treats us in a way that completely violates um, our mattering, our sense of dignity, if I'm lying on a beach, soaking up the rays, I'm thinking about this right now because I'm freezing <laughs> in here, right? I'm lying on the beach, soaking up rays, and <clears throat> excuse me, some some big guy wants to get from point A to point B, and I'm lying supine in the sand, and and he doesn't step over me or go around me, but just clump clump clumps right on my stomach to get to uh, the next point. What am I going to? I'm going to feel a complete outrage, complete indignation. How can you possibly have done that? You had reason not to behave that way. What is the reason? My pain, my suffering. You know, there is animals, no way. animals don't care about causing pain to each other. In and the that, natural world, animal pain, predation goes on all the time. What he's doing is just preserving his evolutionary advantage is on not a natural the, uh, That is not the point I am concentrating on. All I'm right. co concentrating on the point of me <laughs> lying there thinking in my wrathful indignation, how could you have done that? You had reason not to do that. My pain gives you reason not to do that. There is no way that we can conduct our lives without having those kinds of reactions, which they are emotions, they're that what? they are emotions, indignation, yes. outrage, that are very complicated. They're called uh, moral emotions because they have hidden in them the claim that somebody has reason to act otherwise, right? And there is no way that we can conduct our lives without having the, these reactions, right? If well, I were to, isn't that yes? exactly my point, that it's impossible to live consistently and happily as though your life were valueless, as though you had no value? I agree with we, that. So, so that is our starting point. And from that, one goes on to other things. Then one thinks, well, if I can't possibly live without feeling that my life has some value, uh, that when you treat me as if I don't matter, this outrage I, I, I feel, uh, you had a reason to act otherwise. What is it about me that, that gives me this uh, claim of, of ha putting reasons on you? When I think about that and try to justify it, I very quickly see there's nothing special about me. Everybody is living this way. Everybody knows first person, naturally, that they matter. They can't act otherwise. They can't conduct their lives otherwise. Um, and that is what Spinoza called conitas, right? That this is, a, this is a complicated emotion. It is in some sense what the genes would have a very complicated creature like us uh, who has... Uh, self-reflection and reasons um, would, would end up saying, I matter, and then ask, and, and why exactly do I matter? Uh, you come to the conclusion, and not so quickly, right? It's taken us millennia, it's, you know, because I come from this tribe, or I'm a member of this race, or this people, or I'm a, this uh, gender or whatever, slowly, 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 it's taken us a very long time to actually get to the point, uh, and moral philosophy has helped us a great deal here, that what it is in virtue of which I matter is the same in virtue of which we all matter. Why do so many people then uh, 
to tussle with the question of do I matter? Like why, why do so many of us struggle with the meaning of life then? Well, we're all pretty much painfully self-aware of all our inadequacies. People know that they're finite and brutally breakable and capable of reprehensible actions. And it makes all of us doubt the, the validity of our claim to a continued untrammeled existence. And we have to bear the existential guilt that that knowledge of finitude and insufficiency and malevolence leaves us with. And I would say that's part of the call to noble action as an antidote to precisely that call to what you could be rather than what you are. That's a good call to meaning. I also had an answer to your question. I had a dream. <laughs> I had a dream once, and I'm speaking psychologically here, not, not theologically. I had a dream once. I was in the cemetery of an old church, an old cathedral, um, surrounded by the graves, and there were indentations in the grounds where all the graves were, and all of a sudden the, the graves started to open. And it was a graveyard where great people, great men of the past had been buried. And so grave opened and a, an armed king stood up. And then another grave opened and another armed king stood up. And this happened all around me. And these were very formidable figures, right? They were the great heroes of the past. And after a number of them appeared on the scene, they looked around and saw each other, and being warrior types, they immediately started to fight. And the question is, what stops the great kings of the past from fighting? And I had a revelation after the dream. I can't remember if it was part of it, but in, yes, it was part of the dream. They all bowed down to the figure of Christ. I thought, and then I woke up and I thought, what in the world does that dream mean? What in the world could that possibly mean? And then I, I, I understood it. I understood that if you have 20 kings, let's say, and you took the thing that was most king-like about each of them, and then you combined it into a single figure, then you'd get a single figure of transcendent heroism, of transcendent good. And it's a tenant of the Jungian school of psychology, let's say, that that figure of transcendent good is symbolized by the image of Christ. And the purpose of that image is so that even the tyrannical king has someone to bend his knee to. And that's absolutely vital. I mean, it does, you don't have to approach it from a religious perspective, although you inevitably do, because when you speak of things at this level, that's what happens. But you need an image of the transcendent embodied good to, to serve as something that unites the great tyrants of the past. It's something like that. It's an emergent, it's an emergent vision of embodied unity. And it's a psychological necessity. It's a sociological necessity. And I think it bears very strongly on your question about why is it that people matter. It's the, the, the classic Western answer to that, the Judeo-Christian answer to that, is because you have a spark of divinity within you, and that divinity is a reflection of this transcendent good. And it's obligatory for me to recognize that in you and vice versa if we're going to inhabit the same territory without mayhem peacefully and with the ability to cooperate. Now you might say, well, the mere fact that a transcendent image is necessary as a uniting figure doesn't prove the reality of that image. But I would say, well, yes, but it doesn't disprove it and it strongly hints at something more profound, especially when you also ally it with the observation that the encounter with something truly admirable produces the instinct of awe. And that's not a rational instinct. It's an irrational instinct, but it's a marker that you're in the presence of something greater than yourself. 
And it's not something that you have voluntary control over. It's something that overtakes you. And it could easily be a reflection of the truth. Now, you can make a biological you can make a biologically reductionistic argument about that, but it starts to become extraordinarily difficult because you, you, you enter into the realm where these transcendent experiences of religious significance and awe are a phenomenological and psychological reality. And it's not easy to explain why that's the case. So... I need to say that I'm, I'm somewhat... <laughs> somewhat uh, suspicious of uh, the transcendent. Uh, some things that make us feel uh, part of what, something think that greater. What makes people matter is transcendent. You said that no, already. Uh, no, what, no, 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 no. I said I did not. No, no, no. I said I was using a transcendental kind of argument a la Kant. That is transcendental. Transcendental. Argument. This is not. It's, this is different from transcendence. Well, if I don't it's the same it's for everyone. It's transcendent because it transcends the individual. If there's something well, about the every individual well, then, that matters, then human it's transcendent. Nature is transcendent, right? Because that's fine nature, with me. That's fine with me too. Okay, <laughs> that's there, good with uh, me. There, there's, there's a. There's a vocabulary confusion here that needs yeah, to be cleared yeah. up. You're talking about a transcendent reality beyond the natural realm. Rebecca doesn't believe in such a reality. She says everything is confined to the laws of nature and things subject to that. But she's using the word transcendental, a transcendental argument like Kant, where in order to justify, for example, reasoning, you show that without the assumption of reasoning, you couldn't even deny the the validity of reasoning. It, it's a, it's a, it's a, almost kind of pulling it up by your bootstrap sort of argument. That's what you're talking about, right? Very, it creates the very conditions for coherence in go. our life, right? And I would say, you know, this, there are uh, transcendental arguments and for logic, for uh, induction, for deduction, for induction. Um, and I would say for norm, for moral reasoning as well, that there are certain, uh, preconceptions uh, that are, uh, we can't live our life uh, coherently without them. We can stop with ourselves, but if we push it further, that's exactly what uh, the Spinoza uh, project was, uh, a completely naturalist deduction um, of, of ethics. He calls it the ethics. Um, it had a profound effect on European history it took a hundred years, but it seeded the Enlightenment from which so, many, so much moral progress uh, has derived that uh, I am very much a beneficiary of it as a woman, as a Jew. Uh, I am very much a beneficiary of that, uh, of, of, of what came from the Enlightenment. Um, but, um, yeah, um, what did I want? But uh, the thing that I, the thing that I was, was, was that makes me, uh, you, you the, the, lar the bigger, being part of a movement that's bigger, that makes us more than we are, this kind of uh, trying to transcend um, our humanity, that makes me very nervous because, you know, I mean, again, uh, my, the imprint on my mind is always uh, both the victims of the greatest horror, uh, that I, I know of, and um, and the perpetrators of it, who felt so transcendent, uh, those Nazis, right? They they were part of a very larger than life movement uh, that made them feel, you know, with talk about symbols, symbols galore, spectacle galore. Uh, it was a kind of drunkenness of transcendence. I have a horror of that. I, I'm nervous about that. Give me music, give me art, uh, give me great novels, give me poetry, that kind of transcendence. Uh, but the sort of transcendence, that is the transcendence that makes us feel all at one in our humble uh, humanity. Uh, that kind of uh, transcendence I'm, I'm, I believe in. But, but I don't like the, the larger symbolic we are transcending our human condition. Let's just be human. That would be triumph enough. We want to move very quickly into starting to take questions because we're 
the time is moving. I, but, but first, I want to talk about the Twinkie in the room. Um, because that really is <laughs> about religion, I think, putting rules on you have an answer to the meaning of life that religion would be a freedom experience, I'm sure. Can can you respond to that, Dr. Craig? I, I didn't catch the question. What Just is this idea of religion being an oppressive reality oh. versus a meaningful reality for the meaning of life. I think that the argument that I have offered this evening is simply irrelevant to the societal effects upon of religion. Um, you cannot judge the truth or falsity of a worldview based upon its societal impact. Um, for example, Einstein's theories of relativity being largely misunderstood uh, led to a cultural relativism where people thought he meant or taught everything is relative. They didn't understand the difference between relativity and relativism. And so in some ways, relativity theory has had negative cultural consequences in terms of promoting a kind of moral relativism. Does that show the theory is false? Of course not. The truth or falsity of a worldview doesn't depend upon its societal impact. And so as a philosopher, I'm just not that bothered or interested in what are the social implications of uh, theism. I'm talking about a meta-ethical argument, a metaphysical argument that will give us an objective grounding for significance, human value, and purpose in life that can then be fleshed out in practical normative ways. This is from a viewer. How does your perspective on the meaning of life account for evil and suffering? Would you like to take that first, Dr. Peterson? Well, <clears throat> I, I read something very interesting many decades ago. It was a Jewish meditation on finitude. And it was presented in what you might describe as a Jewish Zen cone. And there aren't that many of those. Um, so here was the question. What does a being who's omniscient, omnipresent, and omnipotent lack? So those are the three classical attributes of God. And the answer was limitation. And that was the reason for the creation of man. That there's something about limitation that the absolute lacks. Say, well, being requires limitation, let's say. Because if you can be anything at all at any moment, then you're everything at once. And in some sense, you're nothing at all. We're in this situation. Our being is defined by our limitations. And that produces suffering. The question is whether there is a mode of being that justifies the suffering. That's the fundamental religious question. And I think that the answer to that is yes. So being requires limitation. Limitation necessitates suffering, but there are modes of being that allow you to transcend the suffering. That's the hope. And then with regards to evil, it seems to me, I have to speak metaphor physically or theologically here, that a universe without the possibility of evil is also one without the possibility of good. And I would say that if human beings conducted themselves properly, we could have a universe where free choice was the rule. We were free to choose evil, but there would be no evil because we would choose good. And I think that we should be very careful at laying the existence of evil at the creator at the feet of the creator without looking to our own role in producing it. So that's my answer to that question. Dr. Craig, would you like to... Okay. Uh, 
Uh, this is a question for you specifically, Dr. Peterson. Do you believe religions like Christianity have a role in the pursuit of discovering that which is opposite of evil? Well, I think that that is what they are, fundamentally. In the entire, I've spent a lot of time trying to understand the underlying narrative structure of the Bible, for example. It's a very strange collection of books, <clears throat> but it has a narrative structure. And the narrative structure is something like, well, people fell into history when they became self-conscious. And because they were self-conscious, conscious of their own limitations, conscious of suffering itself, they were also able to become and motivated to become resentful and cruel and bitter and homicidal and genocidal. And, and that's, I suppose, in some sense, the genesis of evil. Our life is bounded by suffering and tainted by malevolence. And there's a pathway through that. And as far as I can tell, the Bible, the entire Bible, is a meditation on the pathway through that. Now, it's not a meditation we understand because most of it's story. It's embedded in stories. It's and stories are the way that we transmit information that we don't yet understand. And so, but I think that the Bible, properly understood, is a is the best. What would you say? It's the best set of instructions that we have to understand what it would mean to live a life that would enable us to bear suffering nobly and to constrain malevolence. That's what it looks like to me. And I can give you a quick example of that. There's an idea, a deep idea, that emerges in the first chapter of Genesis that the being that extracts habitable order out of nothingness and potential uses truthful speech to do that as the mechanism by which that occurs. And that the habitable order that's extracted from the chaotic potential by truthful speech is good and that the capacity to do that is part and parcel of each human being something I believe to be as accurate as anything can be accurate and so there's an idea right in the beginning right in the first chapter of that book that if pe people spoke truthfully that the order they spoke into being would be good and I believe that to be the case, and I think that people experience that in their own lives. You know what happens if you lie to yourself. You know what happens if you lie to other people and betray them. You produce little pockets of hell within you and around you. And if you cease to do that, then things improve, and that begs the question of just how good they could get if we ceased to do that altogether. So... Dr. Craig, this question is for you. All right. Why does the lack of ultimate significance entail the lack of temporary significance? It seems to me that um, in order for something to be significant, to be important, it needs to make a difference. That's what it means to be significant. And so if no matter what you do, everything winds up the same, your choices are ultimately insignificant. That is to say, they're inconsequential. And on naturalism, all of our choices, the entire human race is ultimately inconsequential. It, it doesn't matter. It's insignificant. And that seems to me to be virtually undeniable on, on atheism. Um, may, I, may I deny it? Excuse me? May I deny it? Sure. Um, you know, it, 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 you, somehow it's this temporality that seems to really matter to you. Um, you know, that unless it is, you say, you're right, it's, it's almost a tautology. In, in order for something to be significant, it has to make a difference. Uh, but, but why can't it just make a difference uh, for some duration? and not forever. If somebody is in pain, yeah. is suffering, and I can 
do something to take that suffering away, that matters. And it doesn't matter that neither I nor the sufferer will exist, you know, Well, let's forever. remember that my argument is a tripartite argument. And yeah. there are three components to it, purpose, value, and significance. Now, I agree that if things have objective moral worth and value, then their being merely temporary does not mean that they're insignificant. That in that case, you can have significance despite its transitoriness in virtue of its moral worth. But my argument is that in the absence of God, there isn't any objective foundation for the affirmation of objective moral values and duties. These are simply illusions fobbed off on us by the sociobiological evolutionary process. And therefore, um, you can't rescue significance by appealing to the inherent moral worth of temporary yeah. things. If it were only um, the biological process, the evolutionary process, um, how could it be uh, that through reflection, slowly, far too slowly, we actually can make progress, right? Everything. So, so every, you know, so uh, there's nothing more biologically determined than um, uh, male dominance over women. Uh, nothing is more, right? This is. Uh, well, now wait, Rebecca. <laughs> by, by what? By and what yet, do you wait, underestimate yeah. women? <laughs> <laughs> we have we have our ways but but um but you know and but we are slowly you know this is or there, there's all sorts of behavior that is biologically determined right xenophobia uh i spent a lot of time in africa observing the chimps it was uh, one of the most amazing experiences for me i mean i came back and all I could only see, uh, I, I came back to a conference, um, actually, uh, and there were two men on either side of me. Uh, so, <laughs> this is my fate, this is my doom. Um, and um, they were uh, arguing over me, and there was a little lady in between, and you know, and they were pointing their fingers and blah, 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 and trying also to impress me a little bit. And, um, and, you know, I, all I could see was what I had just seen um, in Uganda, right? These, these men. You mean among, you know, among the bonobos and the chimps? Um, not bonobos. Oh, bonobos are entirely different. Bonobos are uh, Fair female. Enough, but yeah, the point yeah. is among that the, the, chimps, same, yes. the same sort of social behavior exhibited by Homo sapiens is already present in their primate relatives like yes. baboons and chimpanzees. Yes. And there is no reason to invest human morality with any more objective significance than that kind of behavior that evolution has pr programmed into other primate species because it's advantageous in the struggle but for survival. It's just a herd morality. Progressed. That is not how we progress. That's what, not what? Moral, what, what civilization is, what moral progress is. Wait, is wait, battling, where, where do you get the word battling, progress oh, yes, on I get the progress. a naturalistic worldview? I think on a naturalistic worldview, you would be justified in talking about moral change, but the word progress smuggles in yeah. Yeah. a standard. Yeah. Yeah. But that's because you think, that's because you think on a naturalist uh, basis, on a purely naturalist basis, uh, there is no way to justify, to ground objective morality. That's what you, True. I mean, right. C could so I? So since I don't buy that premise, uh, I do think that one could talk about moral progress. Could I read you a quotation, and I want you to comment on it. Sure. Okay, and here's the. Left before you do that. We are running out of time, as All much right. as I hate to say it. So please do that. Please do that. And then I'm going to okay. ask you to each a make a last statement. The scientific outlook has taught us that some parts of our subjective experience are products of our biological makeup and have no objective counterpart in the world. The tastiness of fruit 
and the foulness of carrion, the scariness of heights and the prettiness of flowers are features of our common nervous system. And if our species had evolved in a different ecosystem or if we were missing a few genes, our reactions could go the other way. Now, if the distinction between right and wrong is also a product of brain wiring, why should we believe it any more real? And if it is just a collective hallucination, how could we argue that evils like genocide and slavery are wrong for everyone rather than just distasteful to us? That's a statement by Steven Pinker. <laughs> Well, <laughs> um, yeah, uh, Steven Pinker clearly believes that we can make sense out of moral progress That's his, uh, and believes that we can ground morality on purely naturalist. We are creatures who offer reasons, right? Uh, we offer reasons, we reflect upon reasons, we reflect upon our own reactions. Uh, certain of our reactions are biologically determined, but we reflect on them. And we can ask whether or not, we, this is how we are not animals, this is how we are not ships. We can ask whether these reactions are right. What gives us the right? Would we, were I not myself, would I tolerate this in somebody else? We're able to rise to that level. Evolution has given us that capacity. It's given us language. It's given us self-reflection. It's given us the ability to contemplate points of view other than our own. That's what human intelligence is. And given that, and given certain reactions that we have that ground our lives, that without these reactions we could not even pursue our lives, we can ask, what is it? Am I special? Am I special that I have the right to ask you uh, to treat me with dignity? Is there something cosmological? Do I cosmically play some special role? No, obviously I don't. That's delusion, that's insanity. This is the kind of reasoning, reasoning that is, that biology has equipped us with that allows us to go beyond the chimps that we descended from. Thank you. I'm gonna ask each of you um, and I'm gonna ask you to start with this, Dr. Peterson, and this is what, how we will end this evening. I'm gonna ask you to pretend you're speaking to a friend or maybe a young person who is struggling with finding meaning in life. And I'm just gonna ask you to share what you would tell them, how you would encourage them as we end out. been working on trying to get this these words right these particular words for the last couple of weeks and good answer maybe to the question being is suffering tainted by malevolence and so what's the meaning There's pain to alleviate. There's chaos to confront. There's order to establish and revivify. And there's evil to constrain, not least in our own hearts. And that's meaning enough for everyone. Um, you know, we are creatures who, we're, we're trying to get our bearings. Uh, this is, I think, a, something very, very deep about us. We come into this world, we 
want to know what it is. Where are we? What are we? And, and what are we supposed to do with whatever it is that we are? We are creatures who are trying to get our bearings. Um, and we ask two sorts of questions uh, in trying to get our bearings. We ask what is, and we ask what matters. Um, and the question what matters comes in two forms. You know, who matters and what matters. Um, and we all, we all want to matter. Uh, we all want to matter beyond the first person, of the, the thing that's just given that our genes are driving us to feel as if we're matter until our genes are replicated into the next uh, generation. Um, and there is, I, I guess I concentrate, you see a lot of darkness um, and I see so much more light uh, in trying to uh, make our lives matter. Uh, the, the, the positive value that we can add most importantly to those fellow creatures, those who are going along, we're all in on this together. Uh, trying to get our bearings, any help that we can offer, any contribution that we can offer, uh, like this, right? I mean, this is, this is a meaningful occasion. Uh, people struggling hard with very, very different points of view uh, to, to say something that will be universally beneficial, no matter how much you disagree. That is meaning. Get in. Get, I would say to them, get in on this fight, get past yourself. Uh, think about uh, all the other fellow creatures who are with you in this struggle together and, uh, and let's join forces and, uh, and move forward. That's what I would say. Thank you. Thank you. The great American philosopher William James once remarked that we may be in the universe as dogs and cats are in our libraries, seeing the books and hearing the conversation, but having no inkling of the meaning of it all. And I would want to encourage you to think that perhaps the universe is a far, far more wonderful place than you've yet suspected, that there may be a transcendent, personal God who created the universe and you with a goal in mind to know him and enjoy him in a personal love relationship forever. You find yourself now alienated from this being of perfect goodness and love due to the moral evil that has been so poignantly described tonight. But there's forgiveness and cleansing available if you will but avail yourself of it. And so I would encourage you to do what I did as a teenager seeking for the meaning and purpose of my life. Pick up a New Testament and begin to read it and ask yourself, could this really be true? Could there really be a God who loves me and who has sent his son, Jesus Christ, to redeem me that I might know him forever? I believe that if you do that, it could change your life in the same way that it changed mine.